So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Geoffrey Moyer, and I'm with the Great War Centenary Association. And I'd like to thank Andy and Carol, and especially the community members, for having us here with you this evening to discuss probably one of the most important projects that you'll be dealing with this year. Now, the first thing I'd like to say to you right now is you may be wondering why wasn't this done before? This all stems from George Hunter, who was Lieutenant in the Canadian Expeditionary Force, who designed the Cenotaph in this community. 1971, on the anniversary of D-Day, he came on Decoration Day and explained some of his reasoning behind it. And I'd like to say why he didn't have names on it. He said, the central block has a or dedicatory inscription carved on it. It will be noted that the inscription reads, in honor of those who served, and in memory of those who died. On the majority of war memorials, the names of those who were killed in action are inscribed, uh, but the committee agreed with my suggestion that these should not be inscribed on the memorial. It was considered that there were then many men languishing in veterans hospitals, and even to this day, many of our comrades are suffering from the effect of war wounds, and service will ultimately die of the effects of that service. These men actually suffered more in their life than those who died in action. And so it is a living memorial. But right now on the centenary year of the armistice, I cannot think of a better project than this to start to recognize those from the First and Second World War in this community. So who is the Great War Centenary Association? And who are these three young people who, you know, came from Brantford to tell you who should go on your war memorial, especially for the First World War. Well, I can tell you that it's a very dedicated team. Uh, the other two members that I have with me right now is Megan Cameron, who's a teacher at BCI, Dr. Andrew Irochi, and our other members who are not here are Dr. Peter Ferruja from Laurier Brantford, Evan Habkirk, who is just finishing off his PhD at Western, Paula Whitlow, who is the uh, Executive Director of Woodland Cultural Center, Vincent Ball from the Brantford Expositor. We all come from different disciplines, but we come with a lot of passion for uh, the First World War. So our mandate is right up there. Let me just read through it for you. To create an evolving, interactive online experience for historians, researchers, and the general public. To host community events and grow the public appreciation for history of Brantford, Brant County, and the Six Nations during the Great War. And most importantly, to engage the youth of our communities through educational programs. This here is what you'll find on our database. I'm just gonna fly through this because Megan will be dealing with this later on. But the We Remember database is a comp or compilation of research of over 5,000 different men and women who served during the Great War. Covers testation, enlistment information, circumstance of death, service notes, letters, gallantry citations, pictures, and memorial plaques. So in this database, there's over uh, 2,800 pages of transcriptions from the Brantford Expositor. And one of the focal points that we have on here is our history, and it covers how the three communities of Brantford, Brant County, Six Nations, how we dealt with all aspects of the war, from the home front, uh, what else do we have up there? Industry, you name it, it's in there, but Megan will get to this later on. One of the biggest features that we have is a lecture series. We do this every February, March, and into April, where we'll grab nationally known historians and local historians to discuss First World War, uh, how it affected especially Canada. And our first one comes up March 1st. And we're very active in the community where we partake in 
uh, the culture days, digitization programs, Canada Day, you will see us at a lot of events. Community outreach and education. We've been at Major Palachi, BCI, Paris High School, uh, and three, three uh, Canada Day events, I believe. And you're going to find us on social media. If you do have Facebook, Twitter, you can follow us that way. Now, let's just get really into the project. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about, as every member here knows, the naming on the two lists that you originally have, there are a lot of spelling mistakes. Who is right? We figure right after the First World War, we were not going to forget this. 60,000 Canadians were killed. Memorial plaques started coming out immediately, especially in churches starting in 1915. You may come across the list that we provided and saying, why is our spelling different from their spelling? And a lot of times you're going to assume that the church plaque, how could they possibly get some person's name wrong? Well, unfortunately, it did happen. <coughs> right at the very top here, you're going to see something. Is this list correct? Brantford Expositor published this in 1931 when they were going to carve the stones for the Brant County War Memorial. You must remember, uh, and many of you probably do know this, Brant County War Memorial covers everybody. Some people assume that Brantford has their war memorial and only those names on it are, are Brantford men. Now, I don't know if you could see it right here, but one of the big problems, you're going to see a name at the very, let see, oh, uh, second line down, Guy Lee. This person is from Paris. And another Guy Lee. You have A. Guy Lee, Sydney Guy Lee two different spellings. This is one and the same person. His name is Sidney Arthur Guy Lee. I hate to say it, but the Brant County War Memorial has a lot of mistakes on it and a lot of duplicate names. Big part of this problem is two months after the death of Harold, uh, Harold Preston, the son of the expositor, editor, and owner, he was pressing throughout the entire First World War for the community to collect names, but they never did. So what ended up happening, getting closer and closer to the Brant County War Memorial coming out, there was a big scramble to figure out who these men were. And unfortunately, I've got one quote that came from them, and it's in regards to omissions of names saying the list of names for the war memorial seems to get more complexing as time goes on. With the Great War now almost 13 years in its history, it has found that some names have not been included. There seems to be a conflict of names with Christian names being in many cases in doubt, and trouble develops in names that are spelt singular and plural. So look at us, close to 100 years later, we're still dealing with the problem nowadays. So I can tell you with our group, we put thousands of hours into this project and going through the list of these men, looking at attestation papers and how they signed on. And we think we have a pretty decent list, but we're putting it forward for you because ultimately it is your community that has to pick. We can provide all the research for you, but it really is up to you to go through these names. Now before I hand this over, we're just going to take a look at one more person, and I, I don't know if there's anybody who would know the Sass family at all. They, they were from St. George and came into Paris, but they, you and St. George share this person. Uh, there's two names actually on the St. George War Memorial that are also people from Paris, but you're going to see, or I don't know if you could see that from back there, on the Brant County War Memorial, his name is Sass, S-A-S-S. -S -S. That's how he attested with the Canadian Expeditionary Force. In 1925, 
on the Memorial Hall when they came out with the plaque. His name is S-A-A-S. The next plaque that winds up on the St. George Cenotaph is S-A-S-S-E. So the 1901 census and the 1911 census have his name as being S-A-S-S, the way that he attested. His father who passed, I took a look at his uh, death certificate and it is S-A-S-S. -S. But the death announcement for him in 1933 is S-A-A-S. So these are some of the problems that we've come across and he is one man that really we should be looking after or looking at to find out if any family members are around. They had a German background. Who knows, there could have been, they want to anglicize it. But we do not know. So we are putting forward in regards to that man, the way that he attested and the way that his name is on the Commonwealth War Graves Commission's register and how he is on our cenotaph. But more of that will come with Andrew Rochi, who I'd like to bring up. And he will give you a little talk. Thanks, Joffrey. Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So I think Joffrey has already uh, illuminated some of the complexities that are involved when it comes to deciding how we memorialize men who served in the Great War, who were killed in the Great War. Uh, and uh, it's not a new problem. Uh, Canadians have been dealing with these issues now for 100 years. Uh, here's a remarkable photograph taken down the street in 1930 um, that uh, speaks to that legacy. Uh, it's especially notable because roughly at the center of the photograph uh, appears Canon F.G. Scott. Uh, he's got a, um, a walking stick under his arm and you can see his medals on uh, one side of his uh, tunic uh, and of course Scott was known uh, across Canada and beyond because he had been uh, the divisional uh, chaplain for the first Canadian division uh, so we're not the first people to tackle this problem um, uh, it's been um, something that's involved uh, generations of Canadians now uh, beginning with those who fought in the war who served overseas uh, and now we're dealing with it two or three uh, generations removed um, but to help contextualize some of the complexities of this issue even further, uh, we thought it would be worthwhile to step back from the uh, local perspective uh, and consider how uh, the war dead of the British Empire more generally were commemorated during and after the war. Uh, because looking at that process, um, if it doesn't give us a model to follow when deciding which names uh, should appear on a monument and which ones shouldn't, it at least gives us a sort of benchmark for comparison uh, from a methodological uh, standpoint. Uh, when we look at the uh, commemoration of, of British Commonwealth or British Empire casualties uh, overall, uh, we end up uh, following all the roads back to one central character, uh, and that's Sir Fabian Ware. Uh, Fabian Ware, uh, before the war, uh, was um, involved in various pursuits. Uh, most recently, before 1914, uh, he was a mining executive with the Rio Tinto uh, Mining Company uh, in South Africa. Uh, but when war broke out, Fabian Ware attempted to volunteer for service in the British Expeditionary Force. He was rejected on the grounds of his age. He was already in his mid-40s by 1914. Uh, but Fabian Ware wasn't uh, put off. Uh, he pulled strings through his uh, business associates and was able to secure uh, a posting to the Western Front as a member of the Red Cross. If he couldn't go in the British Army, he went in the Red Cross. Uh, and, of course, he arrives on the Western Front in the midst of the opening campaigns of the war, which witnessed, if we average out uh, the number of casualties per, per, uh, per day in battle, and then look at those as a proportion of the number of soldiers engaged, some of the very heaviest casualties of the war. This is before trench warfare even gets underway. And what troubled uh, Fabian Ware uh, in his work with the Red Cross and with casualties was that there was no mechanism in the British forces for keeping track of the names of men who were killed 
and where their remains ended up on the battlefield. Uh, where were men being hastily buried? Who was going to account for this after the fighting was over? Uh, military authorities, of course, had to keep track of absolute numbers of casualties, but were less concerned with names and burial locations. They had other priorities to undertake at the moment. So Fabian Ware, not lacking initiative, took it upon himself to begin keeping track of British war fatalities, British Empire war fatalities, uh, where and when they were killed, and where their remains ended up or were thought to have ended up. Uh, this was all on his own initiative in the Red Cross. Uh, and gradually his work began to uh, attract the attention of the British High Command, uh, because the High Command, although it was preoccupied with other uh, war fighting priorities uh, understood that as more and more uh, British citizens and British Empire citizens uh, put on uniform and went to war, that when the war was finished, their families would want to know what happened to men who were killed. Uh, where did they end up? Where were they buried? There would be an accounting uh, that would need to be done because this was no longer simply a professional army. It was now a citizen army. Uh, so the high command took notice and in 1915, uh, Fabian Ware's efforts uh, were officially recognized by the High Command and transferred from Red Cross control to British Army control. Uh, and, and Ware was put in charge of an organization called uh, the Graves Registration Committee, which was sort of the prototype for what became the Imperial War Graves Commission in 1917. Now, we don't call it that anymore. In 1960, the Imperial War Graves Commission was renamed uh, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Uh, that's the name of the organization that still functions today, uh, more than a century after uh, Fabian Ware uh, got the ball rolling. Uh, so how does and how did uh, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission or the Imperial War Graves Commission, whichever you choose to use, how did it approach uh, the commemoration of British Empire War fatalities? Well, uh, of course, it asked itself the same types of questions that we're asking ourselves tonight. Uh, whose names do we record? Where do we record them? And how do we record them? How do we make these decisions? Uh, and being a, a high-level organization that was responsible for casualties across the empire, uh, it had to make decisions that were going to affect everybody. These decisions had far-reaching implications at the time uh, that continue to affect us today. Uh, some of them were popular decisions, others were less popular. Uh, and indeed, some of those decisions uh, would influence how communities like Paris or Brantford went on to pursue their own local commemorative initiatives when the time came after uh, the war was over. Uh, consider, for example, uh, the key decision made very early on that British Empire war fatalities, as a general rule, and with very few exceptions, would be buried and commemorated very close to where they died. Uh, if they died in France, they would be commemorated in France. If they died in Palestine, they would be commemorated there. If they died in hospital in the UK, that's likely where they would be buried and commemorated. There would generally be no repatriation of fatal casualties. Now, this may seem to us like an obvious decision, given the complexities of the logistics that would be involved in shipping home tens of thousands of war casualties, not just to the UK, but also to Australia, New Zealand, India, and Canada. It would have been very costly and difficult to undertake at the time. Nevertheless, uh, families across the empire, not least Canada, were not necessarily enamored with this decision because, of course, the average Canadian family in the post-war years would never have the finances to travel to France or Belgium to visit the grave of their son or husband or father. It was simply out of reach of most people at that time. Uh, so. Uh, the, the chances of ever visiting uh, uh, the grave, if a marked grave existed, uh, were slim for many people. This explains in part why we have a proliferation of local monuments, like the one in Brantford, for example, that have names on it. Uh, because many Brantford families would never go overseas to visit the graves of their, uh, of their loved ones. So that's one example of how higher level commemorative initiatives shape what's going on uh, across the empire or across the commonwealth. Uh, at the local level. Um, other important policies that the uh, War Graves Commission undertook um, are, are worth mentioning. 
uh, at least in summary. One of those was that all casualties, fatal casualties, regardless of their station in life before the war, regardless of their uh, military rank or their social rank, regardless of their ethnicity or their skin color or nationality, would be equally commemorated. There would be no special markers for officers. There would be no special markers for the wealthy. Every soldier, whether he was a private or uh, a major general, would have the same marker of the same pattern because their sacrifice was seen to be equal uh, and they should be treated equally uh, from a commemorative standpoint. Of course, that's something we have to keep in mind when working at the local level as well. How do we decide who goes on to uh, the monument? Are we treating everybody fairly? Right? This is an important consideration. Um, there was uh, in the uh, commission a decision made that although families would not be able to choose where their next of kin was buried, uh, they could at least have the option of adding an inscription to the marker. Uh, so there was some interplay between uh, the commission and between the next of kin of soldiers that the commission was commemorating. And of course, we have to have that interplay at the local level. We have to ask people, what do you think? What can you tell us? Who do you know that should be on? Uh, on this um, um, local monument whose name may not already appear, right? Uh, so that is a model that I think uh, we should um, consider. We also have to keep in mind that this work may never be completely finished. New evidence will come to light. New information will come to light. Uh, the War Graves Commission ended its first official survey of the battlefields searching for casualties uh, in 1921. Uh, and it rearranged cemeteries and basically um, set out the lay of the land for uh, war cemeteries across uh, the former battlefields. But by 1939, by the time the Second World War uh, uh, broke out, more than 38,000 more British Empire um, remains had been found on the battlefields. And every year since then, a few more remains are found, which continues to change uh, the commemorative picture because uh, you have instances where men who hitherto had no known grave have now been located and they have to be uh, given a, a grave. Uh, and that's sort of a complicated process because keep in mind, for example, that in the Canadian context of the 60 or, or so thousand fatal casualties that we incurred, Roughly one in three do not have a marked grave because their remains were not located or because their remains were lost. That meant that their names, uh, the, the names of the missing, if you will, uh, were commemorated instead of being on a stone, they were commemorated on a communal monument somewhere on the battlefield. Uh, if you've been to Ypres, for example, you've probably been to the Menin Gate, which has several thousand uh, names of uh, First World War soldiers from the British Empire who were killed in Belgium between 1914 and, in most cases, 1917, and have no marked grave. Well, what do you do in a case where a man whose name is already on the Menin Gate uh, has his remains discovered in 2004 and is put into a marked grave. Do you take his name off of the Menin Gate? No, of course not. But now his name is in two places, uh, and that, that uh, breaks the rule of equality of commemoration. Because according to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, each man should only be commemorated in one place. His name should not be marked in two different places. Now, we've already broken that rule, as, as Joffrey pointed out, locally in many instances, because you can find the same name on the Brantford Cenotaph as you can on the Paris Honor Rolls and maybe in St. George or other surrounding communities. Right? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if it's unfortunate or not, but it's just a fact, whereas uh, a top-down organization like the War Graves Commission can say, okay, uh, Private Bloggins is going to be on the Menin Gate, that's it. Uh, there was no such organization to govern local commemoration after the war. It was up to each community to decide whose name do we put, who belongs here, who belongs someplace else. Uh, that makes, in, in some sense, our job at the local level even more complex than what was undertaken by the War Graves Commission uh, because it had the authority to make uh, these final decisions at the transnational or, or imperial um, level. Uh, so it gives you an idea then of uh, some of the parallels that we, uh, that we see um, uh, at, uh, at the higher 
uh, level of decision making and, and how those sort of translate to our own um, preoccupations here at the local level. Uh, one um, question which uh, has come up as, as our committee has, has looked at these names and, and ones that are on the monument or on the existing honor rolls, the two honor rolls that you have um, reproduced over here at the side uh, and those that may not appear on the honor rolls, is which men and women exactly qualify as war fatalities? Now, if you ask the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, they will say that for the First World War, uh, those who are classified as war fatalities are men or women who died while they were in British Empire uniform, while they were in military service, between the outbreak of the war in 1914 and roughly the middle of 1921. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why 1921? The fighting on the Western Front ended in November 1918. How do we end up with this extension going uh, three or four years after the fact? Well, the answer is fairly simple. Uh, as far as the British government was concerned, the war was not officially concluded until the middle of 1921, when the fourth of five peace treaties with the former central powers, the enemy powers, was, was signed. Uh, so remember, at the end of the war, there's a peace treaty with Germany, but there's also one with Austria, Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, and Turkey. Now, the Turkish treaty didn't come until 1924 because things in Turkey got out of control. I don't want to go off on that tangent because it will get hopelessly complicated and it will test your patience. Uh, but the fourth of those five treaties was concluded in 1921. This marks the official end of the war, even though most soldiers were demobilized two or three years earlier. Uh, but if a man uh, who um, was in uniform uh, died in um, service-related conditions after 1919, he could still count as a war fatality. If a man who was in military hospital uh, died after uh, 1918 or early 1919, before the middle of 1921, he could still be counted as, uh, as a war fatality according to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Uh, after the cutoff date, no matter the circumstances, you're no longer considered a war fatality uh, because somewhere the line had to be drawn. Uh, the War Graves Commission could not continually be adding men whose circumstances of death would be increasingly tenuously associated with their military service. Uh, and I don't mean to be flippant about this, but uh, a man is discharged from the army uh, uh, in early 1922 and he falls down the stairs and, and is killed, he is not a war fatality. He's not a war casualty. Um, but when we turn back to uh, names that appear uh, on local memorials, and Paris and Brantford are, are no exceptions, we find that there is no clear cutoff line as far as when we stop counting a fatality as a war fatality as war dead. Now, Joffrey began with the very important point that the designer of the Paris um, uh, War Memorial left names off originally because he felt that men who were dying decades after the war would ultimately need to be counted as war fatalities if their lives were cut short by injuries or stresses experienced during the war, right? Which is completely at odds with how the War Graves Commission did its business. Now, I'm not telling you that the War Graves Commission was right or that the monument designer was right, but we have to come up with some type of, 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 of benchmark, some type of, of rule or, 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 or system, if you will, for deciding exactly how we uh, inc include names or exclude names. Uh, but as it stands, there are already cases of, of men on this monument uh, who would never have been counted as war fatalities, according to the War Graves Commission. We have examples of men, uh, at least one example of a man on this monument uh, who's included, who never went overseas uh, and may not even have had his uniform on before he died of sickness in Canada, uh, closer to the beginning of the war. He would not be counted as a war fatality by the War Graves Commission and was not counted as a fatality by the War Graves Commission. Uh, before I uh, pass off to Megan, I'll raise one other uh, um, complication that, that we need to take into account when deciding about these names, and that is who exactly 
assuming that we agree that a certain list of men are war fatalities, which ones belong on a Paris monument? Which men were Paris men? Well, how do we how do we draw that line? It's uh, the, the 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 identities of 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 Canadians, you and I and everybody, are so uh, sometimes difficult to delineate. How do we decide who is from Paris? Uh, does a man have to have spent the majority of his working life here? Does he have to have had family here after the war? Does he have to have had a residence here? Did he have to have enlisted here? Uh, all very difficult questions to resolve. And again, if you look at the very first name on the honor rolls that are um, already uh, uh, that, that already exist, you'll find Victor Arding. Well, Victor Arding never set foot in Paris. He had no uh, affiliation with Paris. Uh, personally that we can find, he was very clearly from the west end of Toronto and is commemorated uh, in a mo on a monument in the west end of Toronto, but he ends up on the Paris uh, honor rolls because during the war his wife happened to be temporarily resident here and this is where she was situated when the war ended. So because she was here, he's on the, he's on the Paris honor roll. He had nothing to do with Paris before. Now, we're not going to take Arding off of the honor roll, uh, but, but the reason that we raise that particular example uh, is because we're going to have to ask, or, or the community is going to have to ask, some difficult questions about where boundaries are drawn as far as who is a war casualty, who counts as a war fatality, and if he, is a war, if he or she is a war fatality, do they belong on this monument or would they be better situated uh, someplace else? I don't have any solutions for those questions, but we at least have to put the questions onto the table, I think, uh, before going too much further. Thanks. So with that in mind, uh, we are basically putting the responsibility of determining these names to the community, and we're going to show you exactly where all the research is. We've done all the research. We've compiled all the research. And now it's your turn to sort of do that. So I'm going to show you how to navigate um, our website, which is the centerpiece of our organization. It's comprised of two separate components. The first is a very extensive database of over 5,000 men and women who served in the Great War from the three communities that we focus on, Brantford, Brant County, and Six Nations. Um, and we also have done contextual histories um, for Brantford, Brant County, and Six Nations during the Great War. So the role of the uh, Women's Emergency Corps, for example, or the role of Six Nations, or cadets, or anything else like that. So I'm going to show you that part, and then I'll go extensively into our database so that I can show you how to research these names on your own, and then you can start to have those conversations um, about what's going to go on with that, uh, that honor roll there. All right, so I'm going to go to our website. If you haven't already been given a postcard, um, Joffrey had gone around and handed out postcards and flyers, and it has um, our website on it, and it's at the top. It's doingourbit.ca, um, and if you don't have one of those, we have extra copies available that has our website. Um, on the actual uh, website itself, you can see across the top, um, there's multiple tabs. So home is just our home page. The We Remember database is where you're going to find all of those people that are listed in the three communities. Our history is the section where we've done the contextual piece. I'm going to do that very quickly right now. So uh, prelude to conflict, anything up to like snapshots of communities prior to 1914. What was happening on the home front, for example, we have um, a lot of things about patriotic leagues and cadet corps. Uh, life and death in the trenches is, in fact, um, local overviews of various battles, including Hill 70 and Vimy Ridge, Passchendaele, for example, and then casualties as well. Uh, wartime crises, uh, conscription, Six Nations, um, and others, like Halifax disaster. We have a lot on the wartime economy. Um, Brantford was one of the largest uh, industrial exporting um, communities in Canada, and of course Paris is included with that. So agriculture, we have a lot of information there about the local agricultural uh, contributions, industry, and then women, and then we're going to be adding to this as well. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to be dealing with uh, post-war, so the Great War monuments that um, existed after, <coughs> after the war. So we are adding to this, uh, to this website as we gain more information. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to scroll down. If you go to the bottom of our page, um, there's a section called News and Events. 
and that's a blog that we update on a regular basis. So on December 7th, we posted the names of all of the Paris veterans um, to be added to the Cenotaph. And this is kind of like our list of, of, of who we think um, should be included, including some names that perhaps are a bit controversial. So if you are wanting to investigate this on your own, I, I implore you to go to this website and then to, to click on that blog post there. Um, and we've, uh, advocate, we've advertised that through social media. So we'll just go there now, and then um, we'll go through. So you can see there that picture, the image, um, right there. But then what we've done is we've added all of the names um, right here. Okay. So there's the honor roll there, and then if you scroll down, all of the names are there. So for example, um, Arding, who Andrew spoke about earlier, never really ever stepped foot in Paris, but if you wanted to look and investigate that particular name, you could do that. Every single um, person um, who enlisted in the war has a profile on our database that has been compiled through extensive research. So all of the information that you see initially are attestation or enlistment information. So where they enlisted, uh, what uh, age they were, what they did for a living, uh, etc. So you can see here, Town of New Toronto War Memorials already commemorated. Uh, you can see where um, address of enlistment, um, and then you've got the pictures or anything else like that. So the other thing too is that um, we are continuously updating our profiles. So if you had information on a specific in person that's on our profile or on our, or on our on our website database, sorry, and you had letters or photographs or um, something else that could contribute to this uh, portfolio of the profile, we would scan that image and then put it in there. And we've had lots of people um, contact us uh, with information or images and then we just put it right up onto the, to the, port, to the profile. And then what's happened at the bottom as well is there's any letters or documents that are related. So it could be um, a death notice, it could be an obituary, it could be a gallantry uh, citation. All of that has been transcribed and you can see that um, in here as well. So all the information is there. Um, obviously if there's gaps in the information, we would love to know so that we can update um, any of the profiles that we've got. But this is kind of our sort of like handing of the football over to you to say here is the information, here is the research, and now as a community you can decide um, who is and who is not going to be on the, on the Cenotaph. So I guess I'll hand it over to you, Carol, for... Okay, all right. Thank you. 
Um, good evening, I'm Marcus Davidson. I'm one of the senior planners here with the County of Brants. Uh, if, if you haven't uh, gone onto the website, I would implore you to do that. There is an excellent resource and the, the, the volunteers have done a fantastic job with it. Um, what I'm just gonna speak about is, is the actual memorial themselves and, uh, and I guess the research that we've, we've, we've started to undertake with that. <clears throat> so this, the cenotaph is owned by the County of Brant, the lands. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, we look after the maintenance of, of the property. We look after the grass and the snow removal as well as the maintenance of, of the actual cenotaph itself. Um, so what we've done on the side is, is we've provided the, the alternatives for the memorials that uh, are there or are, are suggested. So the first option one is, uh, is made out of uh, Stansted uh, granite, which comes from a quarry in Quebec. Uh, the quote that was received for, for this particular uh, structure was uh, $16,800. And, and what it is for is for two stones that would be added to, to the, the left and the right of the monument itself. Um, Brian McIsaac from Ingham Monuments is, is selling it to the, to, uh, the group at, at cost uh, and it would be installed for free. Um, the, the height of the stone um, would, be, would be five feet high and that would include three feet of engravable stone height and it would be a, a base of, of five foot two inches and that would include two feet and six inches of engravable stone as well. There are additional costs uh, on top of the, uh, the cost of, of the stone itself. Uh, the price that was received was based on the list of names that were, were given to them to work with. Uh, so if there are additional names uh, to be included as researched, uh, we will have to pay for additional etching. That would, that would be cost, and, and that cost is yet to be determined. Uh, additional costs to the stone itself are shipping uh, coming from uh, Quebec. Uh, the, the concrete foundation work, we've been quoted around $4,000 to do, and it requires a crane, a specialized crane that would need to be brought in. Uh, so that's, that's approximately $1,000. Depending on which alternative is decided upon, uh, new walkways would have to be uh, placed uh, and, and that price is yet to be determined. And there is uh, quite a bit of infrastructure in the ground, uh, hydro and water pipes and, and, and the like, and uh, there will be some internal infrastructure that would uh, need to be shifted and moved as well. Um, in addition to the, the costs of actually placing the stone, there are a few additional costs, uh, soft costs, I guess, is uh, uh, newspaper or advertisements and, and um, the graphic artist who had, had done the concepts themselves. So the second option is, uh, is, is for a, uh, I suppose it's a different looking stone. It's, uh, it's a black uh, stone, and let me just get the details of that. Uh, the second stone is, is, is a little bit cheaper. It, it's uh, $13,477. And, uh, and again, the price of that would increase uh, if, if additional names were to be included. Again, Mr. McIsaac has, has agreed to give us that at, at the cost of the stone. The, the shipping cost for that stone is, is $1,000. The foundation is approximately $2,500, and the crane service is $750. This stone is a little bit taller in size. It's, uh, it's uh, six foot nine, inch, nine and a half inches in height, uh, so that would give you four foot nine inches, nine and a half inches of engravable height. Uh, the base is, is the same size, so it would be five foot two inches uh, with a, a two foot uh, six inch engravable width on it. So there are a few different alternatives with, with this stone that have been provided by our graphic artist. 
the second placement, obviously not exactly, would be situated kind of as you walk up, kind of parallel uh, with the, uh, the clock tower that's been installed. Um, uh, the second, or I suppose the third alternative would be a placement of the stone off to the, the right hand side. Uh, and, and this is kind of a blow up of, of what that could look like. Again, there is some additional uh, concrete work that would need to be uh, looked at for that. So we, we did explore other options uh, for, the, for the stone. We, we had explored uh, having bronze or aluminum signs uh, to go on, on, the, on the monuments. Uh, but we're essentially told that people like to, to walk away with, uh, with uh, the concrete or the bronze signs. They are, are valuable uh, and are stole, sold for scrap. Uh, there is also a maintenance um, issue that comes, comes with that because the, the color would fade and, uh, and would peel. Uh, the, the plaques, uh, the other reason was that it was also told to us that uh, water could get in behind the plaques, causing the, the plaques to, to basically pop off when it freezes and thaws. So there were some options that, uh, other options that we did look at. Uh, we looked at it, it, could the names be uh, added to the existing cenotaph? And uh, the answer was no, and the names would then have to be on Brown's, on, on Brown's plaques. And again, could cause damage to the cenotaph. Um, the condition of the cenotaph right now uh, is in, it is in need of, of quite a bit of repair. Uh, parts of the cenotaph are, are almost 90, 90 years old and, and the mortar is cracked in areas and, and the foundation is, uh, the concrete work does need a lot of work to it. Uh, so that is also a project that we will be looking at as well, is, is uh, fixing up the, the uh, cenotaph itself. Uh, we did uh, do research into other wars and other casualties and, and um, there were no other veterans from Paris that were killed in either the Korean Wars, uh, Vietnam or Afghanistan or any other uh, undeclared wars or police actions. So there was uh, research into that. Um, with the proposed monuments, there would be uh, room for additional names if, heaven forbid, another, uh, another war did, did start. Uh, we would have the capability of adding additional names in the future uh, to that. Uh, we did look for uh, potential grants for the monument itself. Uh, unfortunately, that does take, uh, take some time to do. Um, and the government is being inundated with, with requests because of the 100th anniversary of the end of the war. Uh, if we waited to, to see if we had, could get a grant, uh, we would miss our order date uh, to have the stones in place by uh, Remembrance Day of this year. So what we're, we're, what we're looking for is, is, is your opinion on the stone and the monuments and, and where you would like it to be placed uh, on, the, on the Cenotaph lands. Uh, we want to know if the names of the Paris veterans who died while in service uh, should be added to the Cenotaph. And we want to know your preference of, of option of stone and, and where that should be placed. Uh, we are fundraising uh, for, for this. Uh, all donations are tax deductible and you would receive a tax receipt. Uh, the total of the project is, is still unknown at this time until we, until we get the final list and, and until we actually have a, a firm understanding of which stone is going to be placed as well. Uh, we did receive a very generous donation uh, right off the bat and I think it's, a, it's obviously a very uh, worthwhile project. Um, so donations are, are very much appreciated. Uh, we have enough to order the stone. And, and basically it is, uh, what we're looking for is for the additional cost before the stone arrives. Um, so, so we're hoping to get that in August. Um, I think that about does it 
for me, but what I wanted to do is, is actually just quickly say a, a thanks to everyone who's attending this evening. Obviously to the members of the GWCA, you guys do great work and we want to thank you for, for that. Andy Moran and the members of the, uh, the Legion that are here this evening, we appreciate all of your work. Uh, Mayor Eddie, or, oh, he's back there, and, and Councillor Simons, uh, representatives of our, of our council. And Carol Moore uh, is, obviously does some, some great work. Uh, the members of the library staff that are here and we appreciate all the stuff you do for, for that as well. So I think that does it for this evening. I don't know if there are any questions that, that folks may have. Probably. This one? That middle paragraph. I'm not quite sure what you're saying. Um, does that contain both first and second? That would that would be for both of the wars. So we are we are doing memorial for both the World War One and World. That's correct, yes. Yeah. So if there are additions or things that have been missed, or if there are corrections that need to be made to the list, then we're, we're looking for that input.
Second World War, they learned their lesson. The mistakes that we made in the first one, we did not collect the names of these men. We made a promise to these people we would never forget them. But look what ended up happening. We did forget them. Their names, their mistakes. It's really up to this community to come out, rally together the way that Paris always has, that the Senate is not a one-dimensional piece. It's about remembrance. You brought in the memorial clock. You looked at 1992 at the anniversary of the Second World War where you put a plaque up there. Don't forget, you're just offering some suggestions that were unaware of the time because the community did not know. They put their feelers out after the war. Send us your names. Oh, 1930 is when the Senate came out. 1933 when the Brantford Senate came out. People who remembered them passed. They left this community. They were unaware that you were looking for the news. Just think about it that way. So really take a hard look at these names. And equally for the Second World War, we put a few other names up there for you. There was one who went to Australia, another one who went to South Africa. The only reason they were going was because it was the 1930s. There was a depression. They could not find work in this community. They probably would have stayed here for jobs. But one of the RAF men, G, who went, he was killed. Then he packed up and moved to find employment. So these are just suggestions for you to think about. So you take a look at the original plaques and stay with that. But please add Mirror's name on there because he legitimately was missed. But take a look at the other names as well. So that was just my little piece for you to, to think about. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. And um, we'd like you to stay after. If anybody has any thoughts about people who should be added to the list, we're not going to take anyone off. But um, there is a, a few that um, there's still questions, um, as Joffrey was saying. So this wraps up the live portion of our presentation. And, uh, but you're welcome to stay after. Thank you. With the stone? Well, you know, I've kind of heard a lot of um, discussion about the stones, and I think it's about four out of five people. They like the concept of having the stone on each side. But that's, you know, that is up to everybody else. Um, we just kind of put out uh, two different options, just so that you, you had two different options. But um, we'll probably have to get together with the Legion and uh, we'll discuss which one um, that the members or, you know, the, the uh, other people in the community would like to have. So, and that will probably happen in the next two weeks. And we're probably going to have to have the names verified too um, so we can get it off and get it ordered. We'd like to have it. Um, here in sometime in August because there's a lot of work that has to be done and that gives us time to get the grass seed um, in and so it looks um, really great for November the 11th and I'd just like to thank um, John Bishop for coming tonight um, he is one of our County of Brant staff and he's uh, very involved with the Cenotaph so if you'd like to stay after, you're more than welcome to. Thank you.